Hi, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, give me a nod. Okay, well, we are coming to you live from the wind swept vistas of the Aliso Canyon in South Orange County, um, inhabited not only by species of deer, coyote, hawk, and occasional bobcat, but also a troop of PhD enhanced humans known as professors and about 500 students. This is your first time visiting with Soka University directly, virtually or spiritually. Well, welcome. If you're returning for a repeat visit, I certainly would not be the one to blame you since I have been returning to this campus week after week for 12 years and counting. Good afternoon or evening. My name is Oleg Gallickman and I am an associate professor of comparative literature here. And this year I continue to serve as director of our beloved humanities concentration. But enough about me. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Aria Gallus, currently an artist in residence, also artist in basement residence, also professor emeritus at Soka University of America. As far as introduction, it is an academic custom that may be known to some of you to divide them in two parts. Part one usually are facts no one will remember and part two are polysyllabic words no one can understand. Though in most cases I do not stand on ceremony, on this occasion I shall make an exception. Therefore, I shall proceed in two parts. Part one, the facts. Born in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, former USSR, in the twilight of World War, Arya and his parents returned to Poland in 1946, where he spent his childhood. He also lived in Israel before coming to the United States. He studied in Rome, Italy. He received a BFA from Tyler School of Arts at Temple University, Philadelphia, and an MFA from University of Wisconsin Medicine in 1972. Before coming to Soka, Arya taught at University of Wisconsin Madison, School of Visual Arts, New York, UC San Diego, and Fairleigh Dickinson University, among other places. As some of you know, Arya, Arya's works have been widely exhibited, including solo shows at the OK Harris Gallery in New York City and the Zola Liberman Gallery in Chicago not limited to one medium. Aria Gallus works in painting, drawing, metal smithing, jewelry, filmmaking, photography, graphic design, and set design. His notable works include the trademark reflected light paintings and the drawing suite 14 stations, Hey You Dalet. As I found out, Aria is also not immune to verbal arts. As a great lover of words, he also is an occasional translator from Polish, a prolific and eloquent diarist, and a recurrent collaborator with the notable American poet Jerome Rothenberg. Recently, Arya has completed his book, Drawing with Ashes, based on 10 years of journal entries during the creation of his remarkable 14 stations suite two pieces of which are currently on show at the Soka Art Gallery. Now comes part two, where I'm going to engage in what Mary Roach called the bringing forth of polysyllabic words. I think of Arya's art as strong modernism. And that means that we're talking about a very canonical moment in the evolution of 1960s art scene. Even though you can recall this moment very easily if you stop by Tate, Whitney, or MoMA, I think it is quite easy to forget what it was when it was lived before it became all that before anybody knew this would become all that. Well, let's say that at that moment, art found itself suspended at the crossroads of abstract expressionism, old hat. Pop art coming in strong, color abstraction gaining speed and conceptualism and performance, all the rage. 
Many others have gone, but this moment is still with us. And before anybody knew what it would be, let's try to, let me try to paint for you a picture, what I think it felt like to be an artist at that particular moment, to be able to create art. It seems to me, among other things, it was the following things. One, to negotiate these tensions and find an equilibrium not yet given. Also, to paint not the world by paintings, as Arnold Schoenberg said. And what does that mean? Paintings that work as images in their own right, in spite of resemblance. What else? To assert that art is not reducible to an episode in the history of religion or an artifact of the market. Simply because art is sold does not mean it is a commodity. Also, to affirm that the possibilities of figuration on canvas, that magic space delimited by the frame are limitless, while the imitation of the world is always constricted by what the world looks like to us. What else? Well, how about this? To dedicate a life to the creation of something even greater than a set of paintings, but a recognizable and highly technical idiom. And here I'm thinking about Arya's reflected light paintings or his way with charcoal. And that idiom, right, would be singular to one's own name, and yet at the same time would be able to stand up to the entirety of the tradition. I think that's a distinct feature of what I call here strong modernism. I feel all of those things in Arya's work, and many others besides, of course. I think that his presence here, his generous and somewhat miraculous modernist faith, the fact that he was able to keep it, his art, his teaching, elevate our lives against the odds of time and world. Therefore, please join me in welcoming and witnessing the art and the person of Arya Gallus. Arya, please. Don't forget to unmute yourself. I got it. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. <laughs> I couldn't have said what you said, but I greatly appreciate it. Uh, in, in this particular thing, turning uh, blue, uh, I assume all of you see the screen with the words, right? Okay, uh, is that it was sort of a, a, a new way of dealing, which is something actually from the old way of my dealing with my art, which I have not done in many, many years to actually execute this series, this new thing, chromatic modulations. Uh, what I will do is I'll take you, for those of you who are not familiar with, with my work, I'll take you through a very short uh, tour of the last works before this particular series started to understand where I am coming from and why or how I got here. Some of those clues are even invisible to me, but hopefully we'll investigate this together during this presentation. So now this thing doesn't want to work. This is great. <laughs> okay, slight detour to my previous works. Thank you. The last, uh, this is a quadriptic actually uh, of a series called uh, Four Seasons, uh, loosely based on Vivaldi's music, which I happen to like, in particular that suite. And I'm not sure how many movements he had in it because I'm not a musician, I'm just enjoying music. But I decided to have each season to be done in four different kind of moods. The, each piece is about four feet by two feet. The total of the quadriptic is, is, of course, four by eight feet. And what I tried to do here is try to use colors that are not realistic as such, but close to realism, uh, as sort of abstraction concepts of clouds, but always uh, something that I always favor is a grid. And so spring became something of this uh, way that I've broken up one contiguous image into four images, but treating them, each one of them, 
in a totally separate color scheme, but feel like each movement still represents that thing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a way of dealing with uh, color and so on that gives you a challenge. And it's all of those are done on arches on paper and so on. It was a very hard surface to work with, but it gave absolutely no way to my brush. So I had to learn a whole way of working with it. This is the summer uh, uh, quadriptic. And again, I get my sources from imaginary uh, sources that I imagine what and how something looks. And also from flying up, uh, you know, I always took notes and sketches by flying an airplane. But now, thanks to uh, Google Earth, I can actually watch certain aspects. I'm fascinated by the Midwest and you know the, that's why this is called the Heartland series and I take the images and even though they are sort of resembling of what they are I move fields around I add or distract or whatever uh, abstract certain areas and I change the color so here was my what I thought at this point is quite a, a staying away from a certain kind of a naturalism that I would see and just allowing the feelings of each season coming out and corresponding in each one of the images, giving a slightly kind of a warmer tone. This is, you can see that each one of them is uh, an abstract in itself. And it's, it's each square I handled almost as, as its own planetoid, I guess, or its own uh, field of endeavor. And I also, if you notice, I love diagonals because it disturbs the calmness of the image. And you actually are slightly uncomfortable looking at it. So. Another one, and this too, you know, it, it has things of luminescence that I like and colors that could not really appear in nature, but semi-natural looking and so forth. So this is the last of it. Now here's the fall, which is again, one image isn't broken up as opposed to others. And the winter. Uh, and this here was uh, actually based on a small section of a very small photograph that uh, a friend of mine sent uh, me of when she was flying uh, over a snow-covered Midwestern landscape. And what I did in here too is if it appears black and white, I did in each one of them has a tremendous amount of color, but the overall view seems to be black and white. But if you notice, you notice that each one of the images has slightly tingy, the greenish, blue, purplish, brown, and so forth. So if you look at the close-up of, of one of the pieces, you'll notice that here, even though it's sort of supposed to be a, a realistic rendition of the landscape, it isn't. And also a lot of color is involved inside the darker areas of the image. Oh, here it goes. What happened when I started working on, on this particular city, turning blue the, is actually the second one of my things. So I started the first one, which is for many years, I have not used canvas and I've just worked on paper. And those are the two, one on top and the, the blue landscape, the chromatic, chromatic modulation two on the bottom. I started with the top as sort of, this is the final version of it. It's still, it's sort of, I tried to be a little bit focused on that and try to use brighter colors, et cetera, but still it has a relative aspects of reality to it. That means uh, I felt that it still has a, a sort of a grid, maybe not realistic grid as far as uh, spaces of apparent roads or apparent fields. Uh, and, but it's sort of semi-naturalistic, although I have taken, so when I started to work, this is what the painting starts as. It's on the canvas. And I noticed something when I was applying this, is that the, the aspect of, uh, of all those colors, it's a little bit different. It's sort of a watercolory. And I, you know, when people ask me, how do you know what colors you're painting on it? I sort of felt whatever has was there next on my palette and I just put them in knowing that slowly I'll be adjusting colors. And then the stage next, you notice I start working from the upper left to the right because I'm right-handed. I don't like to have my hand covering up the images that I'm working with. And I started adding colors, enriching them and so on, and sometimes changing them drastically. So you notice as things are starting to crawl over the surface and, you know, I, from this to that, you notice I straightened the quote unquote symbolic roads because I wanted them to be much brighter. 
and I started putting in already the secondary colors to unite it. So therefore, the, the orangey red or the cadmium red that you see was a sort of united feature. And still, I came up with this area. It is almost ready until this is the final way. Now, what happens between this stage and that stage is that from here to here, I've not only employed techniques of changing colors, but I employed the rather Renaissance technique of glazing each section in different colors, therefore accentuating some of the greens, or accentuating the blues or the reds and so on, and being able to get this kind of a brilliance. And that was a sort of an appetizer to what I had as the next concept for my number two. The four by, the three by four size paintings, three feet by four feet. Now this one, I actually started to document it more because by now I was learning. This is the final version of the piece that how it exists, but how did we get there? I started very simply by uh, planning a grid and putting some salient aspects of it. That doesn't mean that that's what the piece is going to remain as, but this is something that I established as a, again, a diagonal and a clue. Now you notice that this is really rather enhanced because uh, what I discovered is drawing a straight line on a soft canvas is impossible. <laughs> That means that you have to use your pencil very lightly. Otherwise, you, you're getting any kind of parallel, non-parallel lines, but you're getting some kind of a, a you know, uh, arcs and so forth. So I had to en enhance it in, on a computer to see it. But this is what happens. And again, I started this painting by saying, okay, this is going to be a blue. I had a vision of what it's supposed to be. I had a vision of what the teals. Now you notice in here is you can see that the lines that I put in are rather pale. And that's the only reason I had to make them pale. So I will not distort the grid system. And I start working by simply, actually it's sort of intuitive by adding uh, uh, areas of color whichever way I felt, I know that's not going to be what it is, but it had a certain kind of a calming effect. So from, from this one to this image, and you notice on top here, it doesn't exist, but on the bottom here, I put in a little, uh, on top center, there's a little shin standing for Shaddai or the Almighty. I always put certain things into one of my paintings. On the other one, actually, uh, there's a, a, a menorah, uh, which you can see. But I started working on it and feeling it, it, it you're, you're seeing it now, but this is actually days of sitting, putting a, a certain area and studying it and working mentally, uh, you know, seeing what is it there that has to be done. And I kept adding and adding until I came up with this, which in itself, it looked like a very interesting watercolor painting to me. And, uh, you know, something inside me would say, are you quit while you're ahead? And I said, well, you know, this is kind of interesting to me, but it's not what I wanted. But I didn't know what I really wanted because I had to feel it. I had to understand what's bothering me or not. So I went from here and I started putting some colors in. And that destroyed everything else I've done because it's a whole different scale, a whole different value of colors and so on. And it sort of looked at first like a little planet Earth or some kind of extraterrestrial planet. Uh, and, you know, so I added some other colors to see how, how, it, uh, how it will develop itself and adding reds, knowing that I want it to be blue, but I had to add all the complementary colors to it. So when I look from here, the way it was, you can see that some things are crawling. Now, some of the colors like on the bottom left, I simply added because I had the paint left over on the brush and I was working with the red and I've just put it down there. So it wasn't at this point, a, it's more intuitive than rather thoughtful. And you notice also that the, the sort of earth looking center blue thing, I cut it. You know, I decided to make it into squares because it was just giving me the heebie-jeebies <laughs> to look like I'm painting a planet. I, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to flatten the surface rather than uh, to, to leave it in a sort of a three-dimensional state. So I came to this and then it comes in and you can see how certain things are moving in. On the upper left, you can see that the orange and complementary blue was coming in. There's some additional colors coming in. What's really important to me is the second, uh, the first circle from the upper right. When you notice like that, I built it up this way. And then I went farther on and I started working. It's not my natural way of working at this one. But I started filling in areas that I wanted to get some kind of a more impasto uh, effect and color intensity. 
So slowly, I'm saying, how is this going to be a blue painting? So I've added some things. I've changed some things. If you look at the, the upper left, you see a field has a large uh, orange kind of a breaking up the surface of it. And then I switched it to here, so I decreased the, the orange. Plus, I added, you see the upper two, the light blue and the semi thing, and I added something else to it, so I made it a little bit darker. Now, the bottom is still staying basically the same. Now, this was actually a breakthrough. This point here, up to now, I was sort of not knowing where I'm going with this until I came to this stage. And all of a sudden, the circle that you see here with a blue wedge and so on on the, on the right, I changed everything. I made it into almost a totally irrelevant sunset kind of figure with clouds and so on, but basically working with complements, oranges and blue. And the painting evolved through that. And slowly, as you can see, blue start creeping in. And when I look at it, and I, you know, this, what you're seeing too is exactly, you know, uh, days at a time, when you look at something changing, the shin disappears on top, becomes blue, the areas on top, which was, you know, green and so on and pink, now it becomes blue and orange. When you look at it uh, on the left, uh, left hand side, you notice that certain things get a little bit darker. Now, the process of creating something is that the painting is telling you where to go. Uh, you're trying to tell the painting where to go, literally. And at the same time, there's a, a rather big battle going on. Uh, you know, you sit in there and you feel comfortable. And then sometimes you look at it and it's very uncomfortable and you don't know where it's going to go. And it still has not congealed at this stage. But what I'm trying to do is color-wise to build up the intensity. I want people to feel the blueness of it, but without any kind of contrast, I might as well have put it on this flat blue screen and called it blue and it will be sufficient. Kelly did it very well. So you notice up there on the upper left, you notice the whole field has changed. You know, the red becomes aqua, the pinks become blue. And if you're looking at it, you know, the bottom one here, you see the little area below the dark blues on the left-hand side that also started changing. And slowly, I just kept adding color to it. And not only that, I came up with an idea on the bottom right that somehow use certain aspects of it as a, oh, a river, kind of a delta coming in from washes in the field, you know, and then it, it didn't look right. It, it looked a little bit like uh, Kachila's uh, paintings, which, uh, you know, hide and seek. But you notice I took this, and all of a sudden, on the bottom right, it became that. And slowly, the, you see the uh, center bottom right? There's like a very light pinkish, uh, purplish thing. I shifted it to the orange and the blue. So there's a lot of changes on it from here to here. And I'm starting to feel something that the painting is now telling me that I'm perhaps on the right way, but not quite. And for my next state, I decided to make it slightly bottom heavy, you know, to have some kind of a, somebody's giving me a signal here, lights went out. Uh, and what I do is I keep adding areas to the painting until I came up with this. Now this appears to be a, a solid uh, piece of work, et cetera, but still I felt very badly about the bottom right uh, thing. It looked like some, photograph from a optometrist checking out your retina. Uh, it just didn't feel right. It wasn't the right thing. Plus, if you notice, is that on the bottom there were two rectangles and it didn't feel right. So I added three circular fields. And again, I'm using words like fields, not necessarily to describe what a field is. I'm just saying is that I felt that the circles and that that was just too flat. It wasn't connecting to the rest of the painting. So I kept from there and I started darkening things. Now you notice once I got this a little bit darker, certain things started to hold together. But I knew this is a grid and I wanted the grid on it. So the next step, not only did I put a grid, but I have done, if you took it, a, a, the, the, what I told you looked like a retina, I changed it to a group of fields and maintained the line going to the, uh, you know, upper right. And I switched from this 
to this and I put the grid. Now, this is a typical, uh, what you call it, uh, complementary aspect of the painting is that, uh, you know, use orange and uh, blue and they sort of fight each other. But this grid seemed to be too much imposed on it as if uh, in the old days when I used to do scientific uh, drawings, you had a, you had a, you looked through the microscope and you could see a grid and then you would take a part of the insect or whatever and draw it within that particular grid. And this doesn't, didn't feel right to me. So what I did is I decided that uh, I will, I will use a, I think a quinine syndrome, uh, whatever it's called, uh, paint, it's a certain violet to glaze over the piece. So I did this. And all of a sudden, this has become much more viable to me because it linked everything together, became part of it rather than a superimposed bit. One of the amazing things while doing this particular painting is I would work for hours standing, you know, a few feet away from it. And, you know, therefore my whole field of vision was taken up by the blue. And what would happen, I usually walk at night, you know, uh, before uh, watching TV or going to sleep. And everything from the sidewalks to the black uh, uh, road to everything else appeared orangey or purplish. And I thought something was going wrong with my eyes. I really didn't understand that phenomena until a little bit later when I thought about it, I said, my God, you're looking for hours or a day, you're spending four or five hours a day looking at something that is blue. And obviously your eye wants to see the opposite of it. So therefore, thankfully, I thought something was going wrong with my eyes, but thankfully, once I finished the painting, they returned to a normal status. Now, what happened is that this is how it started and this is how it ended. And there's a long way of turning something from one image to another. And if I were to talk about it on a conceptual level, is that I knew I wanted some colors to work with each other. I wanted some colors to fight with each other. I had no idea when I did this, that this is going to be. And I think a lot of artists have the same thing that people saying, well, you have an idea, you do the art and you do a sketch, you color in the sketch and that's what happens, but it doesn't. And people ask me, uh, how do you know your painting is finished? Uh, my basic answer is that uh, I don't until it doesn't bother me. Now, what you can see here, and I can't uh, record it in this final version, is not only have I used actually rather straight out of the tube paints uh, to create this image, but I also, after the major thing, every one of those fields has been glazed. It's a pretty Renaissance technique, meaning I would put a clear level, uh, layer of something. So if I wanted to intensify a green to make it more green or more blue, I would glaze it, let's say, with phthalo. If I wanted to have some area to be less orange, I would glaze it with a red or, you know, say a blue is maybe a plain, uh, vibrant magenta. So it became a sort of a purplish blue. But I would try to pull almost every color and shade that I can possibly do, plus adding, you know, a complement to the reds that you see by adding green. So basically, I was playing around with it and playing around with the shapes and changing. If you look at this right now on the center right, uh, edge there, you know, that field has changed so much, you know, it, it has nothing to do with any kind of reality. I just felt it needed the green in there needed to be broken up rather than a steady uh, continuation line of the other fields that are going in there. Now, what I have here is I did a sort of a quick review for you to see. I cannot do a time lapse, but I can certainly click much faster. So this is what it started as a grid, and I'm going to go rather fast with this. And it became that. So now what I did, I made a slide of this for you to see that actually all the things that you see on top of your screen, you know, uh, are the different stages of the piece to get toward the toward uh, the finished uh, painting. Uh, you know, art is one of the few things that that's when it's finished, it's not quite evanescent, but the stages are. So 
by my recording it, it's not only for you to see it, but for myself to sort of study it, how I go about certain things or doing certain things. Uh, sometimes Sarah says that if there was a more difficult way to make art, I would find it. Uh, she's probably right. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's interesting for me, even as I present this work to you, to see how many stages something had to go through from basically haphazardly, maybe not quite haphazardly, but putting in colors and so on, and then feeling what the thing is doing, how the painting is talking. And what I basically say about this, that I feel that both I and the painting want this thing, because I'm rather proud of this work, because I feel it is a, a, a certain kind of breakthrough in my coloration that I have not used uh, before. It's the intensity and actually the calmness within the whole intensity. It's not an up art kind of a thing, but it is a rather harmonious way. It's, as I said before, uh, I feel that same, I felt as I told you about musically, Vivaldi, although I, you know, it's, it's, it's every square, every square within the square, you know, uh, it's almost like a Mandelbrot, the fractal kind of a uh, aspect every little square you keep going there's going to be new new universes uh, opening in there and in total i'm rather pleased uh, with the result so i hope you understand how how this went through and it gives you some insight on it and uh you know what i do is i want to thank you for being here thank you if you have any questions i would greatly appreciate them any questions Well, there's no questions, comments. Uh, okay, well, listen, nobody threw tomatoes and egg, Judy. You want to un, un, un uh, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and we will unmute you. Raise your hand with the uh, reaction buttons. I'll see if I can find you on screen. The reaction button someplace. Not yet. Yeah, I see Ann Pierce. I'm going to unmute you. Like a little yellow, like a little yellow hand like that, you're supposed to show something. And where did you go? <laughs> I don't know. Can you unbutton your thing, Judy, on your own? Hello, Aria. This is Mark. Hey, all right, Mark Dresser. Um, wonderful, Hi. wonderful to hear you speak about your process. It's fascinating. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a question about it, but it's just, uh, you know, the clarity with which you speak about a, a process that is both intuitive and you have this huge background that, and this refinement that you're going through in your own. I don't know. Pro again, the word process keeps going up. It was just wonderful to hear you sp to speak about it, and and it, uh, lovely to see uh, the evolution of of a work. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Mar Mark, as as uh, as a musician as you are, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, you know, I, I do use something about my art as a comparison. Some people uh, paint like uh, like Mozart, you know, uh, they do everything comes in actually. And I feel sort of not to give myself airs about that. But if I, I looked at the actual scores, what Beethoven wrote, and it looks like a battle took place on a piece of paper. <laughs> he, he erased it, he changed notes and so on. My Mozart just went, tuh, 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 you know, and, and it went in there. Uh, so each, each one is valid. And to me, this process somehow seems uh, more rewarding to me that I'm asking myself questions all the time and searching for answers. And some of them come out of my head and some of them just actually from the canvas. Right. That makes sense. As, as someone who improvises music, and you know, writes down a, a bare minimum of what it is to to see a document of a process seems so uh, 
soothing, <laughs> you know, in comparison to uh, a process that as I deal with developing, developing language and process, you know, and, and a body of music. So, yeah, I, again, thank you. I enjoyed it. And we have Judy. Hi, Aria. Hi, Judith. Um, beautiful job leading us through your journey there. Uh, beautiful, beautiful painting. And it re really was quite exciting to see the way you developed that, that work and how much freedom you gave yourself to play and try and fail and try again. And what a wonderful result. And there are many universes I see in that painting and the color is just a glow. It's a, it's a magnificent piece. Thank you for sharing your process with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see we have Ann Pierce. And can you unmute? I love the I don't think she can unmute. <laughs> there she is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say how much I respect and admire you as a as a fellow artist and. To, to say um, it takes a lifetime to develop a language in painting. And you have done so and done so well for your whole life. And I, I, am, I am better and, and more uh, full for knowing you and thank you for the work in the world you've done. That's it. Thank you. It's, uh, well, I always say art is not done in a certain level that you can put in the closet and look at it in the, with a flashlight. You know, it's done to reach other people trying to, you know, and it's always even, you know, there's many processes involved in it. One of them is, of course, the painting, talking to the artist, the artist, the painting, et cetera. But then again, the viewer, each viewer comes in with their own history, with their own sensitivities. And then whatever I have put in is that is very open to interpretation, which is exactly what you're looking at it because each person when looking at the work of art should have their own reactions to it. You know, I never try to spoon feed people their reactions to my work. You know, it is there and uh, I always say I'm uh, lucky to be, have been able to, to spend my life doing exactly what I love doing, which is really a gift, you know, to that. And I'm glad that some people are touched and some people, you know, all of you that I can see right now have uh, touched me in my life one way or another. And, you know, whether it's uh, encounters uh, every day or encounters once a week or encounters once a year or once in 10 years, uh, you are part of what I have become. You know, uh, I have a great support uh, at home. I got Sarah with, without whom I don't think uh, things would have been possible, you know, and at the same time, you know, my children, now I have my two grandkids. Uh, it's so nice that they actually like what uh, Lily, I'm Lily to them, uh, <laughs> what Lily, Lily does art. And, and, you know, and I can see my grandson uh, drawing and my granddaughter drawing for my uh, birth. I don't know if it was for my birthday. I think it was for, yeah, maybe it was one of the things that they send me uh, portraits of what, you know, I'm supposed to look like, you know, and they're great. And there's, of course, everybody with different skills because it was five and and, uh, and six or, or, or uh, six and, uh, okay. and seven. But what I liked about it is that one of the drawings was just a hat. Oh, true. <laughs> I thought that was great. You know, so here's the future artists. I think we have Eve also with a comment. Hello. Go ahead, Eve. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, that's great. Yes. Hi, Aria. I know your work is always beautiful, and uh, but I honestly didn't realize the process and how involved it was. It, it's just incredible that you have the patience and the perseverance and the 
artistic, whatever it takes to do that. Is to, I mean, the end result is is beautiful and inspiring. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, many times by some people, <laughs> I have been called uh, the Polish word gnid, you know, which is uh, like a tick. <laughs> And I latch onto something and I don't let go. It no matter what it is, I just keep working at it and work. And lucky sometimes it, it comes in. I, you know, uh, Oleg mentions uh, my drawings and so on. And and you know, uh, actually Oleg has been a, a a model in one of the drawings which will appear in in the spring uh, talk that I'm going to give. Uh, but I love the aspects of being able to find all the ranges within a black and white piece of charcoal or pencil. And at the same time, try to discover something about color. I consider myself, uh, in a certain level, uh, a clumsy artist. I'm not being downgrading myself or anything else. Uh, but I mean by clumsy is I have friends who are artists who can take a brush and come up with a beautiful image almost instantly with a fluid line. And I'm most of an artist sort of plugs along. And so on. I can see it, but it takes me a little bit longer to get to that line. Somebody's call it. Hi, uh, Aria. Well, um, thank you for calling me a model. I, I never thought that's going to ever happen in my life, especially in public. So thank, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, I, I wonder if I can bore everybody to death with an academic question. <clears throat> Actually, I know I can. Um, I, I'm very interested in your use of the grid mm -hmm. because it is such a major motif in that tradition in which you work. You know, Mondrian would be one reference. Some people try to get away from the grid and the square and the Ellsworth Kelly that you mentioned would be one and people who want to work with shapes or just exit the the grid and the square altogether into some kind of between painting and and frame space like conceptualists do so you and and I so you you talked a little bit about the grid and the way you do it and I wonder if you could just tell everybody your how you use it, why do you position it, uh, what functions it, it performs, why it's there and not elsewhere. That's, that's one question. And uh, another one, looking at these two pieces of your work that you put up for us, one, your suite um, with the clouds, uh, and then this one, what is interesting is that the cloud suite, um, the uh, Vivaldi thing, does not respect the grid because it crosses it over. Mm -hmm. But this one does, mm -hmm. and uh, again, that that that's 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 interesting. That that difference, and again, and and it just indicates to me how much the whole issue with the grid and then the figural shape, like the cloud, is at play in your artistic imagination. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, I think I can answer you uh, on something that I always thought about. Uh, originally, as I as you know, uh, or Originally, I started being interested in this by, you know, I'm one of the few people that insist on flying sitting at the window seat rather than the aisle seat, okay? Uh, I feel that Leonardo da Vinci would have given his left lung to be 34,000 feet up above the earth, you know, and seeing the thing. And what, what was amazing to me in that is that humanity, uh, especially when I'm going through the Midwest and so on, it, the, Humanity, you know, the nature itself does not really have a grid as such. But when I look at the fields in the, in the Midwest or, or farther on, uh, you know, the eight mile square, you know, how it's divided into rigid lines, you know, despite the landscapes and so on. When I was dealing with that and I was putting in the clouds is that the clouds destroyed the geometry. So did rivers, so did mountain ranges, you know. So there was it, but I think humanity wanted to put its mark that's on the grid. What I wanted to do, and it's same thing with my, uh, you know, uh, uh, 14 stations things, is to make both things. One, to be very comfortable because the grid is something that maintains a certain structure to it, okay? Almost like a, uh, a, a spider web, et cetera, okay? In its, uh, but at the same time, is that things get 
too comfortable at times when people use grids. That means that the grid being uh, perpendicular to each other, horizontal and vertical, doesn't have the dynamics of it as just random way of looking at something. You know, you can go into a room and look at the uh, the classroom, for instance, and look at uh, the desks that are arranged in front of you, and you'll see parallel going this way down in perspective. But at the same time, if you twist your head a lot of ways a little bit differently, you know, you notice that if you tilt your head and so on, there's a whole new dynamic that comes in there. And it's slightly catchy and disturbing in a certain way, but not, you know, not horrendous or or painful, but it's disturbing and allows uh, to me uh, some kind of a, a kinetic dynamism, if I were to say, about the image. So the grid is there, and I use it sort of as a structure to build upon. Uh, What's really strange is uh, I did work for a while as an electron photomicrographer at Billings Hospital in the University of Chicago, you know, where I would take, uh, I didn't know what I was doing as far as that, but, you know, uh, I mean, I knew what to do with the photography, but, uh, you know, I didn't know how to take a picture with an electron microscope. So when I first got into, got the job, I walked into this thing and people were showing me this thing. It looked like something from Star Trek. And <laughs> I said, I never worked with this model of electron microscope. Of course, I never worked with any model of electron microscope, okay? But what I noticed there too, is there's an amazing tiling going on in nature, okay? There's tiling in nature. A friend of mine who's a metallurgist showed me his thing. So there's a certain symmetry that gets into a certain kind where you have the tiling going this way and it creates crystalline structures. And I see that thing here to me, it's a certain, uh, mildly off-center, but rather pacifying or calm way of me to deal with images, you know? And like in, in this piece, it's a little bit different than say, for instance, uh, uh, on the 14 stations where on purpose wanted people to feel slightly uncomfortable, you know, as if the plane was moving sideways or, or whatever, you know, more oblique, more, more twists, but, the grid is a very big part because it creates a, a, a framework. Uh, there's a famous uh, etching uh, from the 1500s, I guess, uh, uh, Albert uh, Durer looking at something through a little pane of glass, which has a grid on it, you know? So I'm not the person who invented any of that, but you could see that, all right? And that grid always exists for me and depends which way I tilt my head, it, it changes. But yeah, it's it's a structural aspect of it. It's it's probably one of the most formalistic things that I've ever used, you know, on my art. Yeah. Thank you. I think I think the, you're on to something very very deep, and uh, in a sense that, as you said, we looking at it, we tend to think that the grid is the basic and the rational, and the the, the cloudy forms are somehow more spontaneous, natural, or projected emotional forms of order. Mm -hmm. But that's a fairly uh, arbitrary differentiation. So, uh, and uh, the uh, diagonal element in it, that's really something uh, that I wanted you to highlight for us, because I think it's because the image is coherent because it doesn't slide off, fall off, or recess, or advance. Because you've succeeded, it's it hides the success. If I did the grid, it'll probably look like the painting is falling off the wall. And I'm just trying to highlight how delicate and deliberate that is. So I'm sorry, I couldn't resist an, a, answering my own question. I've been teaching for too long, so I'll mute myself right now. Thank you. <laughs> Keep talking, that's fine. Anybody else have comments or questions? Or? Um, we have Tom. Tom no. Yes, uh, I'd like to know, Ari, if you use the computer for your grids to quickly change the color. I noticed that uh, it was pink and all of a sudden it was orange. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a long time to paint that orange. Mm -hmm. can, you use the, can you go into it just to see how it's going to look? Uh, using utilizing say photoshop or something like that no i am pretty uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I am not as 
scientific or uh, I'm pretty challenged on the computer with that. No, I would use a, a image uh, from Google and I would take a larger section of it and I just keep turning it around and around if I liked it or take two images or three images. Or I like a field here or a field there. I'll put them in there. But no, all this, uh, no, I don't use the computer to, to see what the colors are. I sort of think about them, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, it's weird. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure you too, as an artist, uh, uh, Judy, and, and other people here are here. Uh, you know, I, I can actually, I can actually talk to some person. I can look at you now, or look at the screen, and if I want to think of my painting, somehow I actually see it in front of me. I, I can't explain what it is. I don't really see it, but I know it. I can tell every color shade or every section, and I'm sure all of us have it. So no, uh, my my basic thing about computer the art is that for some people it's wonderful, uh, and so on, and it this it describes something that you should know within yourself. If person has absolutely no concept what's happening, and you know you can make a thousand pretty bad paintings in an hour with a computer, you know. I mean, oh, you know, that's, you know, that's maybe, <laughs> maybe you can make you know but again you can make some beautiful things on the computer if you have the talent understand what the you know there's nothing holy about the uh, animal or synthetic hair stuck on a stick you know uh, as opposed to pixels i mean you know art has changed you know you know uh, but uh, no i i do not use it i kind of i sort of go through the process how my eyes see something and do it because uh, you know Changing on a computer would not really help me because I would look at it after I did the change and I probably would change it all over again. You know, it just would complicate things a little bit. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we have Sidia. Mm -hmm. Hi. Can, can you see me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Because I didn't see it. So, uh, uh, thanks, Ari, for uh, the the wonderful talk. And I, sorry, I kind of like missed the early part of the talk. So, and I also I like the uh, Alex's question that is about the grid, and really makes me think a lot. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a question, but about the grid, I actually remember that in you know 18th century, 19th century, when people are you know drawing a portrait. They usually we use like the grid to kind of like you know locate the the structure of the head, the mm -hmm. the head of the you know the mm -hmm. like especially you, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Yes, I, I, I was like yeah, so it's just something that I related to the the grid talk, and uh, it's interesting to think about the meaning of the grid. And I know you said that um, you don't like to you know um, kind of enforce. Uh, the meaning of your paintings and you know like don't want to spoon speed uh spoon feed you know the the people but i i really do have a question about you know your intention of creating this picture or uh, this painting uh with the blue color mm -hmm. and of course you mentioned about the color of orange to make a contrast uh it's uh, it's very impressive to me because you know when i'm do doing the literary criticism there are always some kind of uh contrast and then the tension is there very important. Mm -hmm. So I just want to ask uh, your intention of creating this painting as an artist. Okay, one of them actually is that I wanted to get out of my comfort zone where I was very comfortable with earth-like colors, you know, or naturalistic colors or semi-naturalistic colors, you know, and to create something based upon a landscape grid uh, using colors which are basically not associated with such, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I you know, it's not my blue period or whatever, you know, things like that. But no, it's it's it was just I wanted to see how far out of my regular comfort zone I can get it out, you know, of brightening up the colors and and so on. Uh, you know, I am. Boy, somebody's giving me a sign. Uh, you know, uh, I look at I look at the uh, at at my work is that. I'm probably my worst boss and my best worker, you know? As a boss, I say, you got to work till midnight and do this. And mm -hmm. as a worker, I say, no, I'll work till four in the morning, you know? <laughs> so, so you know, it was a challenge to me to see how I, that's why the turning blue, was, I actually mean by that, is it was a major turn from my comfort zone, 
you know, to create some uh, painting that's a little bit uh, different. And as far as the grids are concerned, too, you're right. I mean, there's people do grids for transferring and so on. There's, a, you know, uh, I actually uh, teach my students uh, how to do a transfer by a system that the Da Vinci invented, for instance, by using diagonals. But the 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 grid uh, the grid is important. There's one thing that I have a, a question with. Like I remember, there's all kinds of books, you know, how to paint animals or how to paint faces. Or and as a student, I was told that a human body is anywhere from seven to eight heads tall, you know, and mm -hmm. it's in the faces so and so forth, and in the middle of your eyes are in the middle of the head, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, uh, that's great for theory. You know, but everybody's different, doesn't really work. Some people are six and a half uh, heads, or some people are 12 heads, some people's eyes are closer, some people are, you know, each one has its own beauty. I mean, I always use the, the picture of uh, Sophia Loren as an example, if you remember her, right? Or she's still mm -hmm. around. I mean, if you took every part of her, it's all wrong, and the proportions are off, the lips are too wide, the eyes are too far set, you know, the head is whatever. But together, it makes a heck of a beautiful person, you mm -hmm. know. And so, yes, I always, I always got kind of uh, pretty upset, like in those books of how to draw horses or how to draw this, because it gives you sort. Or even, uh, I did admire Ross, you know, uh, pretty little, you know, uh, uh, paintings uh, and so on. They used to do with a with a palette knife, right? It was his way of doing it, but it was a sort of a expedient way of getting something that superficially looks good. But there's no nothing inside. So yes, uh, you do start with a concept that you know that usually a face is going to be symmetrical, which most faces aren't actually. You know, uh, you know. But uh, no, I'm glad that you that you noticed uh, that thing in the past that this is how it happens. And I did, you know, if I look at some of the stuff I did when I was an undergraduate. I definitely would do the whole thing, the counter pasto and the grid first before I drew the figure and so on. Uh, so it's good to know what this basic structure is, okay? But at the same time, be able to mod, uh, modify it and change it, you know? And that's where that's where the aspects of my grid come in. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. I don't see, I see only six at a time. I don't know why, but that's good. I don't know how many people there are, but uh, anybody else has any comments or questions, please? I don't see anybody else with their hands raised. Okay, then uh, listen, this has been a good experience for me to interact with you. And I thank all of you for here. Thank you, Oleg, uh, Karen, uh, everybody else, Evie. Uh, Judy, if I didn't mention everybody, and Mark, etc. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it's a, it's an aspect of this time uh, uh, for this particular day that I am at this stage, and I have no idea where I'm going to be tomorrow. You know, I have oh, or four other canvases primed right now. They're sitting there. And I haven't decided uh, yet how to do it. Uh, probably part of it is because I don't know. And part of it, I'm basically scared. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and another part is, hey, life has to go on. There's other things to do than doing your painting. You have a family and you have a life. But yes, I, I, I am going to continue. Uh, right now, my next uh, thing that I was cogitating upon is uh, to do a painting dealing with greens. And I remember in college, somebody told me there's never been a great green painting. And maybe they're right. There maybe never will be. You know, I don't know. But this was one of the standard kind of the things. But I'm going to see what I can do with greens, which is, again, totally out of, you know, I can do greens and earths. That's something else. But doing it with greens, see what that's going to look like. So maybe in next year, I have a thing going, uh, you know, uh, turning green or something. <laughs> It, it attach it to some ecology aspects of it. <laughs> or either that, I'm being jealous. So whichever. No, but, oh, by the way, one thing I want to say, uh, as far as jealousy about other artists and so on, when I see art that really touches me and inspires me and something that I, there's no way that I can attend, whether I'm seeing a contemporary artist or, or walking into a room full of Rembrandts, uh, is... is I don't get jealous. I just get very inspired that a human being could do it, that a human being could actually create.
create something as beautiful as that. And so I'm not going to be a Rembrandt or Picasso or anything else, but I'll try to be a good gallus. Well, now I see, oh, I see dumb people are smiling that Jackie, I see it too. <laughs> Somehow everybody showed up. Tim, everybody. Lisa, oh my God, I see everybody here. The whole Mishpucha, everybody else. Tomoko too, everybody. Good. <laughs> I can't, it's great. Somebody has a hand up. Tomoko, I think. Tomoko, are you unmuted? No, I, I was just clapping. <laughs> <laughs> I just clapped. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was a wonderful presentation, Arya. Thank just you a, very much. It's great to hear you, know, you to speak. Thank well, you. It's it's good. And I think I, in JLA, I see you there too. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's good. You know, it's, I think I think you know. Hopefully, uh, some of you come up to the opening. If you're around here, it's uh, it's happening. The show is still up till I think January sixth, and you'll be able to see that thing. So the opening is the next Thursday, at this time, you know, and uh, and then on a Thursday after that, I'm doing actually a walkthrough for anybody who can sign up for it, where we're going to go through the whole exhibition which covers about, I would say, 60 years of artwork since I was about 13 on. Uh, and I'll talk to people then exactly if people can ask questions in person. And hopefully some of you can make it, you know. So Tom, hop on, hop on a plane. Judy, <laughs> it's only New York and New Jersey. You can make it. <laughs> thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Arya.